Welcome to the Everyday Journal Club. I'm Hope, a biologist with 15 years of research experience, now fortunate to be working in a Nobel Prize winning lab. This channel has three main goals. One, to help you stay effortlessly updated on the latest scientific breakthroughs. No paywalls, no jargon overload. Two, to build a supportive community where we can exchange the most valuable experience-based research advice. Three, to share valuable strategies and concrete examples on how to achieve meaningful scientific breakthroughs. Once we reach 1,000 subscribers, I'll begin releasing content focused on the third goal. Let's go. Let's make great science together. Okay, get ready for this. We're about to unlock a secret you use constantly, but probably never think about how you taste sweetness. For the very first time, scientists have mapped the human sweet taste receptor in 3D. And the big reveal, it's this asymmetric duo, uh, two different parts working together. And get this a common sweetener, like sucralose. It only binds to one specific spot on that duo. Wild. Totally right? unexpected in some ways. Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're jumping into a really groundbreaking 2025 paper in nature. Yeah, think of it like finally getting the engineer's blueprint for your car's engine after driving it for years. We're seeing the human sweet taste receptor at the atomic level. It's a huge leap in understanding. And it's not just, you know, academically interesting. Sweetness is fundamental. It shapes what we eat, how we feel about food. And our metabolic health, which is a massive issue today. Absolutely. So getting this kind of structural detail has really broad implications. Definitely. So before we get into the nitty gritty of the paper, let's just set the stage a little. This sweet taste receptor, it's not simple. It's a partnership, right? A heterodimer. Exactly. Hetero meaning different. So two distinct protein subunits teaming up. They're called TAS1R2 and TAS1R3. Like two unique puzzle pieces fitting together. Precisely. And they're part of this huge, super important family of proteins called Class C protein coupled receptors or GPCRs. UPCRs, they pop up everywhere in biology, don't they? Vision, hormones. They're fundamental cell communicators, like the cell's antennas, basically, picking up signals. And what's always been kind of baffling about this specific GPCR duo is just how much it does. Right, it senses this incredible range, natural sugars, artificial sweeteners, even some weirdly sweet proteins. And it does more than just taste. You mentioned metabolic regulation too. Yeah, its job goes beyond the tongue. And that versatility, recognizing such different molecules, that's been the big puzzle. Because we didn't have the picture. Exactly. For decades, we knew the genes, but we lacked the high resolution 3D structure. Without that blueprint, you can't really see how it works. How does one receptor bind to so many different things? Like trying to fix an engine without seeing inside? Pretty much. Yeah. And how does that binding actually trigger the sweet signal to the brain? It was all a bit fuzzy. So chemists designing sweeteners were kind of guessing, and scientists were debating where the important bits even were? A lot of trial and error, yeah. But this paper, it provides that missing map. It changes the game. Okay, let's dive into that map. How did they finally get this picture? Taste receptors are notoriously tricky. You really are. The breakthrough came from using cryo-electron microscopy, cryo-EM. It's this amazing tech where you flash freeze molecules. Like stopping them in their tracks. Exactly. And then you hit them with electrons to get these incredibly detailed 3D images. It's revolutionized structural biology. And they didn't just get one snapshot, right? Crucially, no. They captured the receptor in two states. It's off state, what we call the emo state, just sitting there. Right. And then they captured it when it was actively bound to sucralose, that artificial sweetener. Seeing both is key. Because you see the before and after. You see the change. Precisely. You can see how binding the sweetener actually changes the receptor's shape. So what was the big picture view? What did this structure look like overall? The main takeaway was this distinct asymmetric architecture. It's not two identical subunits working together. Like we said. Two different puzzle pieces. Exactly. TAS1R2 and TAS1R3 come together, but they aren't mirror images. They form this highly specialized sensor, each part maybe doing slightly different things. Just seeing that overall shape and arrangement was huge. A real blueprint. Now let's talk about where the sweetness actually binds, the sucralose story. You hinted it was surprising. Yeah, this is super interesting. Logically, you might think, okay, two subunits, maybe the sweetener binds somewhere between them or maybe to both. Makes sense. But what they found was that sucralose binds exclusively to one specific region on just one one of the subunit. Oh, one. Which one? It binds to what's called the Venus flytrap domain, the VFTD of TS1R2 only. Okay, Venus flytrap domain that paints a picture. What does that mean functionally? 
It's a great name, isn't it? This VFTD is a large part of the receptor that sticks out from the cell surface. It has two lobes, like the jaws of a Venus flytrap. Ready to snapshot? Basically, yes. When a sweet molecule like sucralose enters the cleft between these lobes, the lobes close around it, clamp down. Wow. And it only happens on the TS1R2 subunit for sucralose. For sucralose, yes. That tells us these subunits have specialized roles, at least for this specific sweetener. TS1R2 seems to be the primary detector here. TS1R3 might be playing more of a supporting or modulating role in this context. Fascinating. How did they pinpoint that binding site so precisely? Sounds technically demanding. Oh, definitely. It was a combination of clever techniques. They used mutagenesis, basically, making tiny, specific changes to the receptor's amino acid sequence. Tweaking the protein itself. Exactly, to see which bits were essential for binding, and they combined that with powerful computer simulations called molecular dynamics. Like running virtual experiments. Kind of, yeah. These simulations let them model how the molecules move and interact over time at an atomic level. Putting it all together gave them this incredibly detailed map of exactly how sucralose fits into that TAS 1 r 2 VFTD, the lock and key. Okay, so the sucralose binds, the Venus flytrap closes on TAS 1 r 2 But that's just step one, right? Yeah. That binding has to send a signal. Absolutely. Binding isn't static. The paper shows it triggers this really sophisticated dance within the whole receptor complex. A dance? How so? The receptor undergoes major conformational changes. Basically, its entire shape shifts dramatically when the ligand binds. That closure of the VFTD on TAS1 or 2 acts like a lever. Setting off a chain reaction? Precisely. It initiates these coordinated movements throughout both TAS1 or 2 and TAS1 or 3. They shift relative to each other. It's not random. It's a very specific activation mechanism. And that shape change is the signal movement moving through the receptor. That's the core idea. That physical change is how the message, sweetener detected outside, gets transmitted across the cell membrane to trigger a response inside the cell. And it involves more than just the VFTD, right? Mm. Other parts are coordinating in this dance. Exactly. The study looked beyond just the VFTD. They saw how another region, the cysteine-rich domain, or CRD, also plays a role working together within the dimer. And the parts that actually cross the cell membrane. The TMDs. Yes, the transmembrane domains. Their asymmetric arrangement and how they interact with each other, their dimerization interface, were also shown to be critical for function. That's crucial for getting the signal from the outside, through the membrane, to the inside. So putting this sweet receptor in context, they compared it to other related GPCRs, mm -hmm. like MGLU5 and GABA. They did, and that's really insightful. It shows where the sweet receptor follows the general rules for this Class C GPCR family. Shared evolutionary blueprints. Right. But it also highlights the unique adaptations it has, how it's specialized for its job of sensing such a diverse range of sweet molecules. It's like seeing similarities between a truck engine and a sports car engine, but also the key differences that make them suited for different tasks. Okay, final step in the chain. Getting the message inside the cell. The paper modeled how the activated receptor talks to its partner inside, right? Gus Dusen. Yes, Gus Dusen. That's the G protein specifically associated with taste, particularly sweet, umami, and bitter. Once the TA1R2, TAS1R3 receptor changes shape upon activation. After the dance. After the dance, yeah. It physically interacts with Gus Dusen on the inner side of the cell membrane. It couples with it. And that coupling is the switch. That's the switch that kicks off the biochemical cascade inside the cell. Gus Dusen gets activated and goes on to relay the signal, ultimately telling your brain, hey, that's sweet. Without that coupling, the signal stops at the membrane. This really feels like it fills a huge gap. We knew the genes. TS1R2 and TS1R3 for ages. Decades, yeah. But the, how, how does sucralose actually bind, or aspartame? How does that binding flip the switch? How do tiny genetic differences change our perception? That structural logic was missing. Completely. This paper provides that atomic detail, and that's why it's such a potential game changer for developing new sweeteners. Moving beyond trial and error. Exactly. Now, chemists can look at this structure and rationally design molecules. They can aim for better potency, maybe longer shelf life, and crucially, try to design out those off tastes or bitter notes that many artificial sweeteners have. And it helps explain why taste is so personal, right? Those genetic variations. Yeah, we can now look at common genetic variants in TAS1 or 2 or TAS1 or 3 and see, based on the structure, how they might actually alter the binding pocket or the receptor's flexibility, potentially explaining why you might love a sweetener that I find unpleasant. And thinking bigger picture, metabolic health. Yeah. This could be huge. It really could. 
with rising rates of obesity and diabetes linked to sugar intake, developing better, safer, low-calorie sweeteners that people actually like is a major goal. This structural insight gives us a much better toolkit for that. It shifts taste science, doesn't it? From just asking what does it taste like mm. to understanding the why at a molecular level. Fundamentally, it becomes a structural biology challenge. Let's talk about the technical achievement itself. Getting this structure wasn't easy, you said. Not at all. GPCRs in general can be tricky, but taste receptors, especially heterodimers like this, are notoriously unstable and difficult to work with. Getting enough pure, stable protein to image with cryo-EM was a massive hurdle. So solving the full-length human TS1R2, TS1R3 structure, both APO and bound to sucralose. That was the core innovation here. Absolutely. And the quality of the maps they got is fantastic. You can literally see the pose, the orientation of sucralose nestled in that T1R2 Venus flytrap cleft. And see the VFTD closing down on it. Exactly. And then you can trace how that initial binding event causes rearrangements that ripple through the entire structure down through the transmembrane domains. It connects the dots, chemical binding outside, leads to G-protein coupling inside. What about those other pockets you mentioned? Elasteric sites. Right, that was another cool finding. The structures suggest there might be other binding sites on the receptor away from that main VFTD cleft. What would those do? They could be binding sites for molecules that aren't sweet themselves, but modulate the sweet taste, maybe making it last longer or come on faster or even reducing aftertastes. It could also explain synergy between different sweeteners or perhaps why some things have lingering sensations. So new targets for fine tuning flavor. Exactly. It opens up possibilities beyond just finding new sweet molecules. You could design flavor modulators that target these allosteric sites to perfect the taste profile. It gives chemists so many more starting points, these medicinal chemistry footholds. Precisely. They can design molecules to fit the main pocket better, avoiding clashes that might cause bitterness. They can stabilize conformations that give a clean taste. They could even explore sites on Te1R3, which is also involved in umami taste. It may be leading to complex, savory, sweet interactions. This really does feel like a turning point then. Mm -hmm. Cryo-EM has cracked open lots of GPCRs, but taste receptors were lagging. They were definitely a challenge. So getting this structure is a benchmark. It proves you can structurally characterize these complex sensory receptors, moving the field from correlation to causation at the atomic level. And it shows this nutrient sensor, just recognizing so many different things, follows understandable structural principles like the other class C GPCR. Right. The immediate payoff is clear. That roadmap for better sweetener design and linking genetics to perception. But the long-term potential, this allosteric tuning idea. That's incredibly exciting. Imagine precisely tweaking taste perception, reducing the bitterness of one compound, enhancing the sweetness of another, eliminating lingering aftertastes. That could massively improve low sugar foods and drinks, making healthy choices much more appealing. So this isn't the end of the story. It's really just the beginning for this level of detail in taste research. Oh, absolutely. Now that we have this foundational structure, the questions just multiply. How do other sweeteners bind? Natural sugars like sucrose or fructose, do they use the same site? Do they trigger slightly different shape changes, maybe explaining subtle taste differences? Or those sweet proteins. Exactly. And how does the TASTE-1R3 subunit's role in umami taste overlap or interact with its role in sweetness? There are so many follow-up studies waiting to happen. We need structures with different ligands, maybe even capture it coupled to gustosin. It feels like we're heading towards a complete atlas of how sweetness works at the molecular level. That's the goal, a design-ready atlas. So to recap, we've peered into the molecular machinery of sweetness. We've seen the surprising asymmetry of the Taiwavar R2 Taos 1R3 receptor. Learn that sucralose binds specifically to the Venus flytrap domain of just Teos 1R2 and trace the dynamic dance of shape changes that transmits the sweet signal. It's the atomic blueprint we've been missing for one of our most basic and arguably most influential senses. And understanding the structure isn't just academic, it genuinely has the potential to reshape our relationship with food, doesn't it? Immensely. If we can precisely engineer flavors for both health and enjoyment using this molecular understanding, well, that could help tackle huge global health challenges like obesity and diabetes without asking people to sacrifice pleasure. It really makes you think, what other fundamental biological mechanisms are out there hiding in plain sight that we just haven't seen clearly yet? 
What other blueprints are waiting to be revealed that could transform our health and daily lives in ways we can barely imagine? That's what keeps science exciting, right? Always another layer to uncover.